everyone. Good morning. Welcome. I'm Monica. I'm the events producer here at Impact Hub. First of all, thank you so much for bearing with us um, for our technical difficulties today. We are bolted out of the fifth floor, which is where we initially were. So this is a, a group effort. Um, and certainly thank you to Lindsay and Dakara who were quick on their feet and rolled with the punches. Uh, uh, Lindsay and Kara from Echo and Green. So Thank you, all of you, um, and especially for those of you who got early and got your workout climbing up the four flights of stairs. But we're here now, and they have coffee and bagels, which it looks like everybody's um, starting off with, so awesome, we are all good. <coughs> Anyways, uh, Impact Hub is a social uh, impact networking, uh, co-working, and event space. We have this floor and the fifth floor, and uh, we are truly excited and honored to be partnering with Echo and Green on this, and because we are such big fans of the fellowship program and what you're doing, so we can't wait to hear more. Um, we have another event coming up on Tuesday the 25th, um, where Generation Citizen, which you'll hear all about tonight, will also be featured. It's gonna be all about how to be involved in local politics. Uh, so if that's anything that interests you, I will be around all day. So thank you again so much, and welcome to the space. And let me know if you have any questions. Awesome, thank you so much. And we're really excited to be here at Impact Hub for um, our upstart this morning. Um, you are our inaugural Impact Hub um, audience, so thank you for um, definitely coming out, and, and if you climb to the four, stairs, four, four flights of stairs, congratulations. Um, so I'm Jana Oberdorf, and I'm the Vice President of Communications at Echoing Green. Um, and for those of you who might not be familiar with us, Echoing Green's mission is to unleash next generation talent to solve the world's biggest problems. Um, and so for almost 30 years, we have selected and supported emerging social change leaders, people like Scott, who you'll hear a lot about in, in the coming uh, minutes, um, through our fellowship program. Um, and we have a community of more than 700 fellows working in more than 70 countries around the world. Um, our fellowship application is open now. Um, and so if you are a social change leader yourself, I encourage you to uh, go to echoinggreen.org and uh, apply. It's open for about another week, um, so get on that. Um, and our application is also open for our direct impact program, which is our um, uh, experiential board leadership training program for uh, members of the corporate sector. So check those two things out um, if you get a chance. Uh, so I'm going to have the uh, honor of introducing Scott. Um, Scott is a 2010 Echoing Green Fellow, uh, and he co-founded Generation Citizen while he was earning his undergraduate degree. Um, Scott's here today to help us understand why his answer to this question, can politics be positive, is yes. Something I think that we really need right now. Um, so after Scott's father joined the U.S. State Department, his family lived throughout Latin America and Africa, and through this experience, Scott saw elections, coups, and began to see how transformative civic participation could be. His bold, big, bold idea was Generation Citizen, um, and you're gonna learn a little bit more about that today. Uh, we're also really excited to have uh, Dr. Hussein Rashid here with us this morning. Um, our Upstart series is all about highlighting the work of our fellows in conversation with other experts and leaders um, and have really interesting, exciting dialogue. Uh, Dr. Rashid is a leader in conservation, uh, leader in conversation on religion and religious life in America and how they operate at the intersection of politics, pop culture, and issues. Hussein is also the founder of Islamic a consultancy focusing on religious literacy and cultural competency, and is a professor at Barnard College. Um, so before he di they dive into conversation, Scott's going to tell us a little bit more about his work, uh, and I'll ask you guys to think of questions along the way. We'll make sure to open questions at the end, uh, so you guys can ask a few uh, questions to both of you, to both of these guests. So I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Uh, thanks to you all for coming and uh, for for recognizing for hosting and I'm excited to, to get in conversation with with Hussein as well so uh, I wanted uh, first on the question I, I I called my mom last night actually for for a picture that, that you'll see later uh, and uh, she said oh, I was just talking about you said why well, she said I was telling someone uh, how crazy you were because you're giving some presentation tomorrow on whether politics can actually be positive um, so let's see let's see what we can actually do with that today. I think it's it's obviously an interesting time to be 
uh, to be talking about that question. And what I'm go not going to be doing uh, is, is giving a, a horse race analysis of what's going on right now. I feel like we all get that enough in our regular lives. Um, but actually trying to, to take a step back, um, both in terms of how I came to this work uh, and what Generation Citizen does and what Generation Citizen work means in, in this current tumultuous uh, Context, I guess, is a diplomatic way of saying it. So, um, just two quotes to, to start out. This is, you know, the idealistic Lincoln quote. People have have given this this, this type of uh, context. Or democracy is governed of the people, by the people, and for the people. So that's what it should be. Uh, and this is uh, a philosopher, H. L. Mencken. Democracy is only a dream. It should be put in the same category as Arcadia, Santa Claus, and heaven. Um, and so what, what, what is the, the actual answer to, to what democracy actually is? Um, so I want to take a step back. One of the things that I think is, is interesting in this election cycle is that it's made us question uh, sort of fundamentally what does it mean to be American? Uh, and what does it mean to be a citizen in this country as it, as it rapidly changes? And I was thinking about this question about politics being positive. I was thinking about my own American identity uh, and my own conception of citizenship um, and how that's changed a lot. Uh, and so this is, this is and, and I will say this is sometimes I, uh, this, this is not the type of presentation that I've made before, so I'm curious how it, how it goes, but thought that I'd try to spice and change things up a bit. So first I wanted to actually give, uh, you know, I think citizen gets thrown around without people really knowing what it, what it means. And so three different ways of thinking about it. Um, it's a right, it's a responsibility, and it's a cultural ideal. And I think one of the things to, to keep in mind here is that too often we think of citizenship in the legal context. Uh, and I actually want to completely withdraw it from the legal context right now because I personally don't believe that in order to be a citizen when we're talking about the political context of this country uh, is, is, is necessarily about the, the, the legal context. Um, so what does it mean for it to be a right? So these are just a few things, uh, and these are, are literally endowed by the Constitution. So express one's right, prompt fair trial, um, run for elected office, pursue life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, all of this you can, you can look through. Um, the second one, which I actually think is interesting because we don't think about nearly as much as I, as I think we used to be, um, is oh, the responsibility one, which uh, I, I didn't get here, but what, is it, what does it mean um, to, to actually be a citizen in terms of responsibilities? Uh, and, and that looks like things like paying taxes, um, serving in the military if, if it calls upon one to do that. Um, but I think that that notion of citizenship being a responsibility is something that I think we've, we've lost sight of. The last one in terms of a cultural ideal, I think is um, in this current election, really interesting to think about. So infused with moral meaning, encompassed by normative principles, values, and expectations that all derive from the social, historical, and cultural context of the times. A lot of words. Uh, what, does that, what does that actually mean? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, you know, Janet was talking about how I, how I grew up overseas. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how that informed what it meant for me to, to actually be a citizen. Um, so I grew up in, in San Diego, California until I was eight years old um, and then uh, moved all around Latin America and East Africa. And so the, the, the place to focus on, um, Here's the responsibility. It's making this. This is interesting to look at. Um, but but looking at stuff like participating in your local community, paying income, uh, serving on a jury, all this is is as part of responsibility. So my American identity, and and so part of this is the picture that my mom drew up, which I think she did a decent job of finding last night, considering she like took a picture of one of those old camera things. Uh, but this is me and two of my best friends in in Kenya on a family trip, uh, on a school trip, and the reason that that I pointed to Kenya. Uh, is so we were living in Kenya from 2000 to 2003. Uh, and what happened in 2001 is the 9-11 the, the attacks. And being in Kenya during uh, the 9-11 attacks was incredibly formative for a number of reasons. So one, prior to 9-11, uh, the, the, the largest attacks that Al-Qaeda had conducted on the United States were actually at the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. This is before we were there, but being in Kenya was something that, that people talked about and thought about a lot. The other part is that it led to a great deal of anti-American sentiment. Um, and when we started the incursions in Afghanistan, when we started the incursions in Iraq, 
uh, every day at school, it was a very international school that I went to, every day um, when I was walking around there was, there was a great deal of resentment towards the United States. Um, this was during the, the, the Bush era, and I'm not trying to be political here, but growing up in that context, it was impossible for me not to reflect on what it meant to be an American uh, in the sense that I didn't really feel American. I hadn't lived in the country for a long time. Uh, I was engaging with peers all the time that were talking about how terrible the country was, how we were pretending that we were better than anyone else, how we were destroying the Middle East. This was how I grew up. I'd get fun of, made fun of for, for watching American football because I was the only one of my friends that, that still watched American football. Um, and so in this context, I didn't, I didn't fully see myself as American like my, my friends in the United States might have. Um, and so, you know, there's actually, growing up all around the world, there's this term that, that people use to talk about kids in that context, they call them third culture kids. And that's sort of what I felt like. I didn't feel fully American. Obviously, I'm not fully Kenyan, although, you know, maybe I pretended to be uh, at points. Um, but, um, but, but, but I struggled in that context. The bottom picture is a story I actually talk a lot about in the founding of Generation Citizen, um, which is that I got to observe the first truly democratic elections in Kenya's history. So I was getting this education on the importance of participating in democracy and how powerful the context could be, but struggling with, with what it meant to be an American. So fast forward to 2005, um, which is when I started college at, at Brown in the United States. This is the first time that I'd lived in the United States uh, since I was eight years old. And so sort of a, a, a culture shock in terms of coming back to a country that I was from and all my friends, because I look fully American, thinking that I was fully American, but not, not fully feeling that. I started college in September of 2005, in late September of 2005, which is relevant because while I was starting, literally during college, uh, orientation, uh, there was this thing going on uh, called Hurricane Katrina uh, in, in the New Orleans, Louisiana area. I literally remember, and, and one of the contexts from growing up abroad is that I sort of had this context of, well, everything is, is, is I have a better global context than anybody else because I've lived around the world, and everything is much worse in the rest of the world than it is in the United States, and people don't recognize what they, what they have here. So it was, it was almost this resentment towards, towards this country in a certain way. And I remember in September, while orientation is going on, I know orientation, no one's focusing on, on anything going on in the world, but I had this, this thought process of, I don't understand why everybody's making such a big deal about this. It's just a hurricane. Like, this country can, can deal with it. It's, this isn't that big of a deal. That was literally my thought process. And so when people were talking about it, my university president at the time had grown up in New Orleans. She cried during convocation talking about it. Uh, and I just, I didn't understand. Uh, spring break uh, of 2006, I went down to the Ninth Ward in New Orleans uh, with, a, with a trip through Brown. This is seven months, eight months after Katrina hit, walking through the Ninth Ward and seeing the destruction on the ground that continued, that our government had not dealt with, seeing uh, you know, things in a worse context that I had seen in, in many aspects of the developing country, the developing world, was the first time that I think I really recognized um, what it actually did mean for me to be American and the fact that this country had problems and to go back to the context that I was talking about before, uh, that I had some responsibility in terms of, in terms of dealing with those problems. And I think that, that gets to an important concept of citizenship that I'll come back to, which is that there are imperfections in this country, there will always be imperfections in this country, and it is part of being a citizen is an obligation to, to right those wrongs. Um, to, to keep going through my own identity, I actually became, still with my international hat on, very active in, in efforts around the, the genocide in Darfur, Sudan. And I sort of, um, you know, right now I, I run an organization and sometimes I think I have to, to go back to my roots, which is really uh, activism. Um, and so this is, this is me getting arrested in front of the White House my, um, my, my junior year at Brown. Uh, and, and that's something I feel like I, I'm like more buttoned up and, and don't talk about, but I really cared deeply about, the, you know, this, this, this I thought was part of citizenship too. Um, believing so deeply in something that, um, that, that, that you engage in, in this type of, of activism as well. Um, 
And, and so I think part of this is, is my whole path to Generation Citizen has been learning what it means for me to be American. And this is something that I still struggle with. And I think all of us are struggling with that concept today um, in different ways, shapes, and forms throughout this election. Um, and it's something that I still, that I still think about. Um, and and it's, it's one of the reasons that I started Generation Citizen. So I think it goes back to literally walking through the streets of the Ninth Ward and recognizing that there was some obligation to do something, um, but that we all have an obligation to do something and that we all have an obligation to, to get political. Um, and so this is, this is, you know, I started Generation Citizen my senior year at Brown. Um, this is, our, our mission essentially is to ensure that, that all young people uh, have the same type of education that, that I did in terms of learning about politics through taking specific political action. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that young people aren't participating in politics in this country. One is that we don't teach them how to. Civics is not something that's part of their curriculum, uh, or when we, when we do teach it, it's seen as the most boring class in school. And so we want to figure out how to get it to be more action-oriented and relevant. Um, and so that's, that's you know, what we do. That's what I applied for, for Echo and Green to do, and that's what we continue to do to this, um, to this date. What we, how the program actually works is that we've created this action-oriented curriculum where students as a class choose very specific local issues that they care about. Um, it's an in-school class, so everyone takes it. It's not an after-school curriculum. It's not an extra uh, curricular activity, and it's focused on local political change. Um, so I think that's important in terms of thinking about the context of this presidential campaign. Uh, it's specifically focused on local politics. And then the other part of it is that we partner college volunteers with middle and high school teachers to, to actually teach it. Um, and this is, this is the specific framework that we think about uh, the, the reason it's an hourglass, we laugh about this with our students because I think older generations understand what an hourglass is, if even from Yahtzee games, uh, and sometimes we have to explain it to, to younger generations, but they start out with very broad issues, so it might be gang violence or policing, uh, and then they narrow it down to a specific root cause, and then they broaden it to think about the type of, of, of tactics that they, that they actually take. Um, and so it might be you know, an issue that comes up in, in New York all the time, is, is obviously policing. You can't change policing in New York in a semester, but they'll look at what's specifically going on in a legislative body right now. It could be looking at body cameras, it could be looking at uh, you know, uh, liaison officers between communities and schools, but trying to figure out how to, how to actually conduct real change. So, so this is, and I, and I wanna get into to conversation, but I think some of the, the challenges, so, so Generation Citizen right now is we're based in New York, we started in Rhode Island, we still have offices in those two cities. We're also, we also have programs in, in Boston and in San Francisco. And one of the things that we've gotten really passionate about, especially in the last year, especially as a result of this election, uh, is, is you know, look at the organization itself. We're just working on the coastal, liberal, urban centers. Uh, and I think that's em emblematic of society at all is that we're not talking to each other anymore. Um, and so we're actually expanding this year into, into Oklahoma City and the Central Texas region as a way to figure out, is it possible for a curriculum like this to actually be effective in different types of contexts? So I think that's one thing that, that, that I'm really interested in and, and we, can, we can talk about a little bit more. But the, the broader question of whether we can agree or disagree anymore uh, is something that I think is core to whether it is, it is positive to be politi about politics anymore. The second question, and Uzain and I talked about this a little the other day, and, and I think we should, we should continue to talk about it. We're predominantly going into classrooms with, with low-income uh, people of, of color, and we're telling them that in order to make a difference, you have to participate in the system. And one of the biggest problems in this country is that people aren't showing up. Now, the problem is, are we essentially telling them the way to fix the system is to show up, or is this? But I think that there is something challenging about a student that walks into a school through a metal detector into a school with dilapidated walls and has to worry about getting home safely because so many black young people have been shot by police in the last, you know decades, it's becoming you know, known to life now, that you can't tell them, well, all you have to do is call your city council member. It's not that simple. At the same time, you do have to get in touch with your city council member about those issues. And so I think that's one of the things when we talk about politics right now in terms of is the system broken uh, or are we not participating in it, um, I think is, is really important. Uh, I think the fundamental question that we're going to have to answer, though, uh, as, a, as an organization, but also as a society, is what happens on November 9th. 
there is so much attention on this, this election. Uh, in, in so many ways, it's completely unhealthy. Um, and this is on, on both sides of, of, of the aisle. It's completely lost the ability to be substantive on this stuff. Um, the election's going to happen. And, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll work despite people saying it won't work. The, the question is what happens on the, on the day after. So I wanted to close sort of going back to the concept of citizenship before we get into conversation about why I think this election has been so abysmal, but why I think it's positive to, it's possible to be positive about politics, which is I think what's incumbent on all of us to think about. And so this summer we had uh, our first student leadership board conference. And so we have these, these young people, we work with about 8,000 young people in four sites. We're trying to get more student-centric as an organization, so we got representatives um, from all of those, those sites to, to come together in New York City to talk about how they can lead the organization. And they were going over their own individual stories. This is in, this is in July. And so one student um, whose name is Lila, who's actually speaking at an event we're having tomorrow, um, she's, she's Muslim American, her, her family immigrated from, from Bangladesh, and she starts telling this story, her story, she's 13 years old, she's in the eighth grade, and she starts telling this very personal story uh, about how, you know, literally she's at uh, parent night at her school, and she, sees, she hears adults talking about, uh, well, how can you tell the difference between a good Muslim and a bad Muslim? as she wears her, her hijab. She talks about her five-year-old sister coming home from school asking uh, if, if, if her and her family is going to be deported. Uh, she talks about the, 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 the threats and what people say on the subway every day. Um, she also talks about how she feels that she has a powerful voice as a leader and she has an obligation to actually participate in the process. Through this whole story, as one can imagine for a 13-year-old, uh, she eventually starts breaking down. She's in a room with, with 15 young people that at the beginning of the conversation were distracted and on their cell phones and not necessarily engaged. She starts breaking down, a pin could drop. One of the students then gets up, Arnab, who's from, and you have these 15 young people who are uh, Latinos and white suburban Americans and undocumented, literally America. And one of them, Arnab, gets up, stands up and says, let's all give it up for, for Lila. And they all start clapping and they're all there for her. That story, in terms of what this election has done, in terms of causing people to actually ask if they belong in this country, is what's wrong with this election. That response of young people to her story in terms of making her feel welcome is why politics can be positive. Because fundamentally, we as a country are about allowing whatever your concept of American citizenship and identity is. And that's why I gave that story at the beginning. I, don't, I didn't feel American when I started at college here. And to an extent, that's okay, because that's what this country is about. It's actually embracing those differences. But there is this challenge right now in terms of figuring out what that actually means. At Generation Citizen, we're trying to do that in a very small way by trying to get young people to realize what their own American identities are and how they can actually take political action. But I do think, and, and, and want to get in conversation now, but I do think it's so important for us to not get bogged down in the negativity of this election because it's not what America is. It's, election, it's an election, it's a point in time. And the only way it's going to get better is if we all stand up like Arnab did and make sure that everybody, whether they're a Muslim American, whether they're a white co-worker in West Virginia, feels part of this country. Yeah, well, Should I sit down here? Yeah, I think if okay. you can turn that and I'll pull the tool away. I mean, uh, these two are a little low. Hopefully you guys can oh, them. thanks. Uh, and we'll move into conversation. Should I? Um, more about Generation Citizen and about sort of what we're facing today. Um, and again, I encourage you to think of questions that you might have, and we'll make sure to open it to uh, the audience uh, for a few questions at the end. Scott, thanks again for that presentation. That was really just wonderful. Uh, just trying to go through some of what you presented. I grew up in New York. I went to high school here. 
And I remember civics classes, we called the government, you know, but US government was a course we all had to take to graduate. It seems to have fallen off, right? Why is that? Why is generation citizen important now? Why, why is it happening now? Why did we get rid of those courses? Yeah, I think it's, it's a good question. And I hear that a lot from, from other generations is I used to take some sort of civics, what happened to it? I think a number of forces uh, took place. And, and, you know, one of the things that happens with education is there's always a pendulum shifting. And so yeah. there probably wasn't enough accountability. And then they moved in the direction of having too much accountability. So there's been this intense focus on subjects that are needed, but subjects like STEM, and there's been a focus on, on testing. And civics gets seen as something that is a nice to have, but not a need to have. Um, so something that's not really vital to, uh, to to make sure that our young people can actually graduate with with jobs in, in the workforce. Some people have actually talked about the the, the moment that, that civics lost its cachet in the American curriculum is when Sputnik launched because all of a sudden we decided that we needed to catch up in the rest of the world as it, as it pertained to science and technology. Um, and, and I also think from a political context, one of the challenges that I've seen is that we're always concerned with winning the next election. We're not concerned with actually building up our citizenry. So people are always thinking about voter registration, always thinking about young people, how do we get more people to register to vote, but not about how do we get people socialized to believe in the importance of politics in the first place. And so I think generation citizen, and then the other last point I'll make is that civics is like, even the word is seen as boring and rote <laughs> and, and like the most boring class in school. So we're trying to get it to be seen as, as action oriented and, and, and relevant. I will say that the silver lining of this election, I keep talking about the positive parts of, the, of this election, is I think it's impossible to look at our democracy and think that everything's okay with it, which is making us actually look in the mirror and figure out what can we do, which has been good for Generation Citizen, because there's like three articles a week written on the importance of civics education. It's sort of like what we should have done in a few years ago, but we'll take the attention now. Right, okay. I guess I want to push you a little bit harder on that, mm -hmm. in that, you know, I'm not old enough to be part of the Sputnik generation, just so we're clear. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that sometimes there are intentional policy choices. So if we look at the way our elections have evolved, and somebody who works in education, right, you look at John Dewey, he argues that a good education is important for a healthy democracy. Right. And in many ways, we seem to be gutting education, not just at higher ed, but at the secondary and primary level, in ways that allow, that are intentional to allow bad politics to emerge. In other words, when we see gerrymandering of districts, when we see um, school choice options being put forward, right? This all seems to come out of very intentional policy choices to achieve political ends at an earlier and earlier age. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, so obviously I grew up in an international context. I think when you look at civics education internationally, sort of two different ways of looking at it. One is to educate people essentially to respect and revere their government. Uh, the second is to educate people to actually change and improve the systems that are at play. And that's mm -hmm. what I would argue that we're doing. I don't think that that's a partisan uh, angle at all. I think that part of being an effective citizen is complaining and actively trying to, to make things better. Right. I think it's, it's valid to make the argument that there are forces that want to perpetuate the status quo. I mean, I think essentially that's, 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 what's, that's what's being said. I don't know if I'd say that it's that that, that people from an educational standpoint are being that cynical about like let's not educate young people to be active citizens because we want to um, we want to perpetuate the status quo one can make that argument I don't know if it would be that cynical I think that we don't prioritize education to the extent that we should partially because it's a it's a long-term play and I think our our politics are geared towards short-term solutions because politicians want to show I accomplished X. Right. It's really difficult to change an education system in a specific period of time. And one of the things that you'll see is whenever a mayor, a new mayor gets into office, they always promise to be the education mayor. De Blasio did this in New York. He starts with UPK. What have we heard? And I'm not trying to be political, but what have we heard about education since UPK launched? And so I think one of the things that happens is that you continue to you continue to, to, to sort of get this, like, how can we improve education like this? And civics education is not that. Right. Um, so just for our audience at home, UPK is universal pre-kindergarten. Yeah. Uh, so I, the other point that came up that really struck me in your talk was this idea of third culture. You talked about being part of a third culture uh, cohort, trying to figure out where you fit in. But that strikes me as coming from a place where you can choose to be part of third culture. You can navigate that. We seem to have populations in America that are so marginalized 
that, and I, here I'm thinking specifically the African American community that have been in this country for generations, but are still not considered part of the American mainstream. How do we start bringing people into a larger body politic who have historically been marginalized? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, and, and I should say, like the term third culture kid, I'm, uh, I'm a white male American, obviously, so I don't, I don't have problems navigating the terrains of, of, of trying to get things done. I think that's more of an internal, personal, like how do I relate to people that have lived in this country for their entire lives? Uh, and I, so, I, so I think, to your point, it's, it's much worse when you have someone that is being prejudged based on external factors rather than, than, than internal factors. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's, that, that goes to the question that I talked about at the end that we struggle with a lot internally, which is how do you tell people to participate in this system that fundamentally tells them that they don't matter? Right. Um, and I don't, I mean, I, I'm not gonna have the answer to that. I think what we're trying to do as a program is show that their voices do matter. And so I think one of the things that happens in Generation Citizen is at the beginning of the semester, we actually ask them, what would you change if you were in charge of your city, your school, your state? No one's ever asked them in a lot of the classes that we work in, what do you care about? Which is, which is sort of this interesting thing. We'll go to, to schools in more affluent areas and they're constantly being asked, what can be better? What can we do better? How can we better serve you? They're not thinking in, in a lot of African-American communities, uh, they're not thinking that people actually care about what they actually think. And I remember one class that I was actually helping to teach three years ago, this is, this is just an interesting vignette, they were talking about the extent to which their subway stations in East Brooklyn, subway mm -hmm. stations uh, were so much messier and dirtier and less safe than subway stations, for example, around here in the Upper West Side. Which for kids to actually recognize mm -hmm. that a subway station as being indicative of the value that society places on them, that's pretty deep thinking for a 10th grader. Yeah. Um, but that, I would say, goes to show that it's not just about ensuring that police community relations are better, although that's important. It's about every aspect of life, from infrastructure and roads to making sure that uh, in Rhode Island it comes up all the time that uh, the, the, the streets in low-income communities get uh, snow plowed much less often than, than more affluent streets. I mean, there's so many parts where government has to effectively demonstrate you matter just as much as, as the, the, the people that live in more expensive houses. So President Obama gave a speech today to some Silicon Valley, uh, not today, sorry, this week, uh, to Silicon Valley business leaders where he says, you know, we can't take the corporate mentality to the business of government. Yeah, I love that. Because government takes on the problems nobody else wants to take on. That's what it's designed for, right? And the systems, uh, you know, democracy is messy, the systems uh, may not be broken, but the idea is that there are, the political process is important, but there are also civil society institutions that apply pressure. And I'm going to do a little shameless plugging right now. Uh, you know, there are two things that I've been working on. One is with the Children's Museum of Manhattan on an exhibit called America to Zanzibar, Muslim Cultures Near and Far, which attempts to, at a very young age, talk about Muslims and marginal communities in America in ways that aren't about marginalization, but about the tapestry of America. And on the more adult side, I've been working with a group called Americans United for Black Lives, which is a crowd pack, which seeks to work on local elections for people who are interested in changing laws around Black Lives Matter. So it seems like there are these institutions that can push our government, which you mentioned before. How does that fit into the work of Generation Change and bringing people together? Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and I think that the, the speech, which is worth checking out, that I think Obama was, that, that, that talked about this, this week, and I think that is, it is pushback, and, and being in the nonprofit sector, I appreciate it too, because you have, I think, people in the corporate sector that are always saying, well, you just gotta do it our way. Um, and I think he gave a similar speech in, in Austin last year in terms of talking about, well, if you just had one widget to, to focus on, then that would be right. easy. Um, but if you have to figure out how uh, you know, impoverished people are actually going to buy that widget and how it's going to be used in different contexts and how it's actually going to be sustained, then that's a, that's a totally different conversation. I think for, for us, you know, the, the role of civil society organizations is incredibly important in terms of pushing government to do better and in terms of, of creating that citizenship where we're constantly asking government to do more. I think what I would say is that the problem that we have is there's still not enough people showing up to the table because people are so fed up with politics that they don't believe that they should actually participate anymore. And I would argue that too many people are going around the system. So there's been a big influx mm -hmm. in terms of this social entrepreneurship stuff, which I'm a part of, which Echo and Green obviously pushes. But I don't really believe 
believe that you can get systemic change unless you're unless you're using your approach, unless you're actually going after the governmental structures that are that are at hand. So I would argue what we're trying to do in Generation Citizen is convince people that in order to actually affect change, you need to participate in the political process. Um, and I think that sometimes can be a really difficult message to assert, especially in a time like now. We're going to have bad political, we're going to have bad participation on, on November 9th because people are, are so, or November 8th, sorry. November 8th, yeah. um, on November 8th because people are so frustrated with the, the system and they don't think that, 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 that their voice actually matters. The problem is, is if you don't participate, the system is going to get worse because the people that do participate are the people that are going to continue to get power. And there's nothing that predicts whether someone votes or not more than their income level. If you make a lot of money, you vote. If you don't, you don't. And that just perpetuates the cycle at, at hand. So I'd argue, one of, in, in order to, to, to get more people to do the work that you're doing through Generation Citizen, we're trying to convince young people of the importance of political participation before they turn 18. Um, before they actually, I, I sometimes use a, uh, analogy of you can get your driver's license in this country when you turn 16, but you don't wake up at 16 with your driver's license in the mail. Right. Um, you have to get your permit, you have to take practice lessons, you have to take a test, um, and we treat democracy like you can wake up at 18 and all of a sudden know how to participate. <laughs> and so what we're doing at Generation Citizen is almost a driver's education course for democracy. Got it. Um, I want to get to the audience, but I want to combine or offer you two questions. You can take it or leave it and we can turn to the audience. So the two I want to throw out at you is you started talking about rights and responsibilities. And it seems using your analogy of the pendulum that we've gotten a lot into our rights as citizens but away from our responsibilities as citizens. So how do we start inculcating that? And related to that, from my perspective, is I'm tweeting this, other people are tweeting this, the chances of me, thre somebody threatening me for saying I'm a Muslim who wants to be an American citizen, even though I am, that ending up in some threat on my life will probably be the end of my day today, yeah. right? How do we? How do I make connections and build community with those types of people? Uh, so let me leave that with you, with that. Um, you take that home with you. I'll forward you the tweets uh, and integrate it as you will. Stew on it for a bit, and maybe we can turn to the audience. Please. Yes, thank you guys both for some really really cool stuff. Um, Scott, I'm wondering, given your um, kind of global citizening, how you see While there are unequivocal benefits of globalization, um, it seems like at the same time it's, it's led to some people, at least in the United States, feeling left out of, of the equation uh, from an economic standpoint or just uh, from a societal standpoint. So, uh, you know, how do you see that all kind of playing out over the next coming decades, and, and how do we recognize the importance of globalization while also, you know, that addressing some of these issues? Yeah. So I'm going to use that to try to address first question, the rights and responsibilities, because I think that gets at mm -hmm. that perfectly. But I think globalization, I mean, that's that's the question that we have to figure out how to deal with and how people figure out, people try to understand that institutions actually represent them and their interests. And I think the problem with globalization is that you have uh, you have people that, that either say, well, statistically and objectively, it's good for the economy and, and, it, and it drives, um, consumer prices down and, and, and it's, it's the way of the world, which, which might be true. And that you have people you know, in Rust Belt America that are losing their jobs because, because they're being shipped overseas. Those are two facts. One, that globalization does drive down the, the, the cost of consumer goods. And two, that it costs jobs. And so the question is, how do you have a conversation that brings both of those to bear? And I see too many conversations where people don't actually understand that. Frankly, there's too many people in financial markets in New York City that will just flat out say that globalization is a good thing and we need to open markets. And that's objectively because I'm looking at the spreadsheets good for the markets, which is true. And then you have too many people in the Rust Belt that say we need to go back to protectionism and they don't understand. So how do you actually have that conversation? And one thing that I will say that, that's frustrating and goes to the rights and responsibilities is that this is where I think the politicians have to be, uh, they have to be more honest with voters. And, and I think this is, this is definitely on both sides of the aisle, but it's just telling people what they want to hear as opposed to globalization is real and it's happening and we have to figure out how to mitigate its consequences for people that are going to be negatively affected by it. 
And that's just not the conversation that you hear happening because no one wants to talk about the responsibilities of citizenship. And the responsibilities of citizenship mean that as an American, you should care about that white worker in the Rust Belt area whose job is being shipped overseas just as much as you should care about consumer goods going down. And you should, as a Rust Belt worker in, 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 in the Midwest, you should care that consumer goods are going down for everyone. I mean, we're all better off when we're all better off. But I think that that concept, what happens with politicians is that they make the claim that, uh, that you're gonna be better off and you're not gonna have to make any sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's really dangerous. And I think we try to do that in our program too, is to recognize that there are trade-offs, that politics is not about getting everything you want. That's just not how democracy works. And so I think we have to figure out uh, how, how, how to make that happen too. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good question that Generation Citizen doesn't tackle yet. Um, what, one of the things that I would say, and, and at the Impact Hub, they're going to do something on local politics next week. I, I tend to think that, that local politics, not I tend to think, I think this is an objective fact, that, that local politics is uh, more important for, for people to engage in than the national election. Uh, and so I think to, to go back to the question, can politics be positive, one of the challenges is that all we talk about is the presidential election. Um, we live in, in New York City. What the city council is doing on a daily basis, what the state legislature is doing on a daily basis, that will impact our daily lives as much or not more than who the next president is. So I think to answer your question, one of the things that we need to do is figure out how do we get more adults involved in, in those types of conversations. If you called up your city council person today, uh, or your state rep, they would meet with you. I've gotten drinks multiple times with my city councilman. Like I couldn't do that with you know with 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 other folks. And so I think that's. But part of it is is getting people to recognize that you do have those local powers that be that will be accountable to you and that will actually listen to you. Um, and so I think that that would be uh, the general gist of it. The other part, and, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to get into the the horse race part of it. But I but I think what is disempowering is the media in this context because the media has focused on the horse race. But I do think that we have to demand as citizens more substantive dialogue and debate and discussion as well. And I think that's something that as adults we can do. So so one specific example of this actually, because I was just I was thinking about just how like this election has influenced things in, in such a negative way. I was in my office the other day. I love my team. But you know, we started talking about the election and it immediately went to the superficial. I mean immediately I think like all we're capable of talking about twenty 20 days out from the election right now is sex. And like, that's literally where it, where it went. And it was just like, wow, like I, like why, why are we as people doing, doing this uh, in, ter in terms of talking about the issues? Like, I feel like if I, you know, if we had a debate right now about what's, you know, what's Clinton's tax policy uh, or, or, or what are the candidates actually pledging to about globalization on a substantive level, I don't know if people here would be able to talk about that. And so one thing that I would say that is important for adults to do too, uh, is to actually engage and think about the issues uh, and read local papers too. Um, you know, read to, to figure out what's going on in a substantive angle locally and not just, you know, what candidate X tweeted last night. Yeah, and um, just, to, just to wrap up, um, Scott, I'd love to hear with the audience that you have here, what can we do to help you and to support your incredible work? What is, what is your ask for us? Yeah, I mean, so I think that, that to, to go back to something earlier and, and, and the, the, the question overall, I mean, vote on November 8th, but I think the, the question for everybody 
uh, is what are you going to do on November 9th? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the question that everybody needs to be thinking about right now. Um, and from Generation Citizens' perspective, we're going to be trying to do a lot after November 9th, too, to, to really focus on the importance of educating the next generation of citizens uh, to actually be informed so that we avoid elections like this in, in the future. Um, and so that looks like everything from, I mean, coming to a class, we have classes all the time in, in New York going on. Um, we have a great Civics Day event where young people present on the issues that they care about. It's like a science fair for civics, um, so we can get information on that. Um, and so I think, so one ask would be, you know, find out and get more involved with Generation Citizen. But, but I guess the other ask to, to go off some of the, the, the questions, I'll make two more asks. Uh, the, the second ask to, to go off what, what I was saying is um, to, to, to figure out what do you think your responsibility is as a citizen on November 9th? Um, not what do you want to do, but what do you think your responsibility is as mm -hmm. a citizen on November 9th? And the third part, and, and I'll sort of get to your, your, the question that I didn't answer, which is a good one, um, but this is something that I've been trying to talk more about, and I think it can be challenging for people in different contexts, but is to talk to people that fundamentally disagree with you um, on November 9th as well. Maybe not now till November 8th. It might be uh, a, little, a little tricky then. Um, but, but on November 9th, because I think one of the things that we're going to have to do is figure out how to, how to rebuild uh, a fabric that, 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 that has been sort of torn apart. And so figuring out how we have those conversations and figure out where those areas of agreement are uh, and, and figure out how we see in our classes all the time with young people engaging on issues that they disagree with, how to make that happen is going to be really important. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, that was fun. Thank yeah, you guys that was so fun. Coming. There is coffee and bagels in the back if you want to grab.